And our guest is Steve Gabriel. He and his wife own an agroforestry farm in New York that grows outdoor shiitake logs and indoor mushrooms. He is the coordinator and does manages production research for the specialty mushroom extension project for the Quinell Small Farms Program. And he teaches a number of courses on cultivation and the business side of starting an enterprise. He also co-authored Farming in the Woods, which has a chapter on forest grown mushrooms. Welcome to the summit. Thanks. Great to be here. So when did you get involved with growing mushrooms? Uh, I've been growing mushrooms for about 15 years and I came at it from the forest. I uh, was thinning a sugar bush I was managing at the time when I was producing maple syrup and um, was turned on to the idea that those logs could be used for mushroom inoculation. And so I was working at that time at a nature center and we did a class with a farmer who taught us how to inoculate these logs. And I was, I was frankly a little skeptical mm. about plug, plugging these things and setting them aside in the woods. But yeah, you know, lo and behold, a year later, they popped mushrooms and I was, I was pretty hooked. Very cool. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, the type of mushroom operation you do. Do you, you do it outdoors and indoors? Yeah, we, we started a hybrid system. We started with outdoor log shiitakes. Um, again, that was my background and real interest. But what we found really quickly was that the markets we had developed really demanded different species. And we wanted to grow a longer season. And also with a changing climate, honestly, we wanted to make sure we were buffered against that. So that led us to about four years ago, adding an indoor component as well as doing the, the log. So we do shiitakes all outside. Uh -huh. but then we can grow a lot, obviously a lot of other things once we have the indoor space. Yeah. Very cool. Well, why don't we dive into it and uh, I'm sure I'll have questions as we go. Yeah. Feel free to jump in. I think we come at it uh, uh, from a perspective of helping folks that want to start enterprises, but certainly a lot of folks just take our classes and access, access our resources uh, as hobby growers. And that's perfectly fine. But as the Cornell small farms program, our, our mission really is to support small farm entrepreneurs. Um, we're based in New York State and we serve the state primarily, but we work also regionally, nationally, and internationally. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. I started working with a research project at Cornell with a professor and then um, joined the small farms program really as we were ready to do more education outreach. So we're really the only extension or university oriented education outfit that, that works on mushrooms, both from the research perspective and the Mm. education perspective and i wish it wasn't actually that wasn't the case <laughs> but a lot of people ask us questions all the time about why there isn't more research going on with production mm -hmm. and it's really because it's been a grassroots oriented movement there hasn't been a lot of university effort universities put a ton of energy and resources into research around like pathogens especially that affect crops of all sorts but in terms of just what does it look like to start a farm what are the parameters and questions, research questions that we can answer, that was something that we really saw as an opportunity. So, so that program has been going for about uh, 12 years. And uh, the first half was mostly outdoor log oriented production. And now we've been focused on indoor production for the last couple of seasons. So I'll share a little bit about that work and kind of an overview of mushroom production from that kind of small farm perspective. Um, okay. there sure a lot of other presentations talk about this too but i just like to highlight that there's you know millions and millions of species in the fungal kingdom uh, if you walk in the woods you might find one of ten thousand fruiting species i personally love to forage and certainly learn about the different roles those organisms play in the, in the ecosystem and harvest some of them for food or medicine i throw these numbers up not as like exact percentages but just to encourage people to realize that most of the mushrooms we come across that have a fruiting body are not either are neither poisonous nor edible they actually are are you know, woody or or out there and very few of them will, will make you sick or, or kill you it doesn't mean you wouldn't want to learn to identify them properly but it's a small percentage and when we get into cultivation what we do is we kind of remove that variable because we're inoculating a known species and a known material and pretty much eliminating that risk with it, cultivation, we really just are, are starting to crack the nut and, uh, you know, there's a handful of species we can reliably cultivate. So out of 10,000 species, we might be thinking about 10 or 15 that are commonly cultivated. And it's, it's pretty wild to think 97% of the mushrooms that we consume in this, in North America are, are just one species, Agaricus bisporus, the, the common button or Hermini or Portobello. So 
Specialty mushrooms specifically are a word that the USDA defines as any mushroom that is not a button mushroom or cremini or portobello. So it's only useful to know that from that perspective if you're looking for funding or understanding what specialty crops mean, specialty mushrooms fit in. It's just anything that's not um, a button mushroom. And so that's, that's really where we focus our effort. The number uh, two and three most consumed mushrooms are shiitake and an oyster, of course. So from an enterprise perspective, those are great places to start from both a production end and a market end because people are familiar with them. Uh, lion's mane is a good example of a mushroom that's really fun to cultivate. People get excited about, but it certainly is something that they have to learn more about and kind of uh, get to know because it seems kind of weird at the beginning of things. So we, we recently got some funding a couple of years ago to really ramp up our specialty mushroom education project. And when we dug into what was happening in the market, we were really encouraged by just rapid expansion, rapid growth of demand for specialty mushrooms and just kind of a shocking figure that, that the, the vast majority is over 95 percent of specialty mushrooms aren't even produced in the u.s but those that are, are rapidly increasing oh, wow. um, at, the, at the same time the, the number of farmers are actually decreasing mushroom production mm -hmm. in the u.s is mostly sort of cornered in in southeastern pennsylvania with a lot of families there that grow pretty large-scale operations but the demand from consumers is increasing so there's a great gap we're seeing that has emerged there to fill um, one of the advantages being a small local grower can provide a really high quality fresh product and that's been our experience on our farm has been really this one where people say i've never seen mushrooms this fresh i didn't even know this was possible uh, i have chefs that have said i've never seen a, a full oyster cluster intact you know because um, usually when they order them from a distributor it looks like someone beat them up and threw them in a, in a cardboard box and they may have been sitting there for a couple of weeks so so small scale growers, I think, really have that opportunity. It's all about quality and maintaining freshness and making sure that you your product really stands out when you compare it to what they can get off the you know the refrigerated truck. So for, for outdoor systems, this is this is a snapshot from our website, which I'll talk about, cornellmushrooms.org. Um, these are ones we've done research with. We have uh, fact sheets and videos on. So outdoor systems wise, we have about six species that we can we can recommend that we can reliably cultivate. They're all decomposers. They all decompose some kind of organic matter, uh, whether it's logs, stumps, or, or beds of wood chips or, or compost. And they all kind of have their own little recipe that we get we get into detail with um, the different uh, different substrates available and the different kind of techniques. And with the exception of shiitake, all these mushrooms fruit on their own schedule in an outdoor setting. It's really hard to control the that fruiting, uh, that harvest, um, and and that's a challenge from an enterprise perspective because you need to have that reliable crop. So we really started by throwing a lot of different things at the wall to see what stuck in our research and found that shiitake was really the one species that in an outdoor system you could grow reliably enough to actually have and sustain a market. And, and, you know, basically make a budget and a cash flow sheet off of. <laughs> so if you, if you fruit these other ones, they can be an, addi an addition to that market, but they certainly aren't something you're going to be able to reliably cultivate week after week outdoors anyway. So, Steve, I don't see oak at all on that list of species. Oak, well, it's right there on the shiitake, right? Oh, right at the beginning. Sorry. Yes, no. right at the beginning. Yeah. For like oysters, it doesn't work with any of the other ones well. Um, I mean, so if you had old chips, the, the wine caps would, would yep. certainly go to those. Um, I've heard of lion's mane being cultivated on oak. We mostly did our research on beech and sugar maple, which were the, the native species that you most commonly find them on. I've definitely heard and found uh, lion's mane occasionally on those. Oyster, you know, oyster is kind of a mixed bag. I think there's a lot more research to do with different subspecies and different types of wood, but mostly we were working with white and yellow oysters and we found the softer, softer wood species to do a lot better. Yeah. Gotcha. But uh, shiitake, you know, originally the shi tree is an oak tree in Japan. And so that is one that uh, most people assume was the only option for shiitake until some of this research, research happened and we found, you know, other species did just as well. Yeah. Um, and then indoors, this is a, a chart again from the website. Um, needs some updating because we're, we're learning all the time. A lot of spawn suppliers will will say that most species will fruit in the in the seventy five you know sixty five to seventy five degree range, with some exceptions like some of the blue oysters like it lower. Um, the trumpets, the king trumpets, definitely like it lower. Things like that. There's new hybrids coming out. There's a new king trumpet hybrid with blue oyster that um, fruits at a higher temperature. So. 
Temperature is always this thing that's thrown out as a range. So one of the, our research goals is to actually fruit mushrooms at different temperatures, keep that really consistent and see what the effects are on, on yield and on quality, especially. So right now we're running two simultaneous uh, growing rooms with one at 65 and one at 75 and really looking at the volume of, of, of harvest as well as quality and, and definitely noticing in the 75 um, some, some diminishing effects on quality that we're trying to quantify so all you know all the indoor mushrooms are generally done on a, a supplemented sawdust or wood pellet base the supplement being something higher in nitrogen and nutrients the exception to that or the addition to that would be oyster which you can also grow um, on straw which really i think opens the door to a lot of lower tech and sort of farms that potentially want to do mushrooms on the side but not invest in all the uh, equipment and expertise needed to develop a good supplemented sawdust or wood pellet formula not to say that that's not doable, but, you know, a mixed veg operation that might already be really busy might find straw inoculation to be a little easier. But it's really up to the, the producer and what they want to do, and we're here to help navigate folks, you know, through that, that process. And I, I think it's really different from my experience in managing livestock and in field crops and things. You know, you certainly, with indoor production, are getting into a system of formulating a mix, being very consistent, being very clean and sterile, and then maintaining these very specific environments. And, and there's almost as much engineering as there is quote unquote farming. Uh -huh. And so, so I, I found some people are really into that and some people are less so, you know, and it really depends on the person. We really like the mix of work, but we like going out to the woods and getting our shiitakes off the logs. And, you know, we're schlepping those logs around. It's a lot of work, a lot of physical labor. And so the indoor stuff really balances it out nicely for, for us in our situation as we go. I'm sure other folks are, hashing out the life cycle many times just a couple things I, i'd want to point out i don't need to go through all the pieces but from a propagation standpoint you know we're not generally uh, starting with propagation from the spores themselves right we're often starting with, with, with mycelium or fruiting bodies and, and starting our, our cultures from there so one thing to think about long term i think with the potential for how we grow our mushrooms or when people ask, well, why can't I grow oysters on oak? Just different questions around breeding is, you know, we're basically cloning a bunch of clones and then we clone them again, then we clone them again. <laughs> and biologically we've created a bit of a dead end in that. And that does provide a very consistent yield from that perspective, which is great. So I can feed my straw, that strain of oyster that I know loves to eat straw. And it'll probably give me X number of pounds of mushrooms per pounds of whatever I inoculate, which is great. But um, in the long term, if we want to, let's say, harvest something from the local ecosystem, people always ask me about like, you know, invasive vegetation that's on their farm, like Japanese knotweed or something. I want to, you know, harvest that, dry it, and then inoculate it. Well, what we probably need to be doing is engaging in a process of training or breeding mushrooms to better consume and produce a reliable yield off that. And that's probably going to require not just cloning, but also potentially sexual reproduction using spores and actually starting from that point. So, so there's a lot of work. I just want to put that seed out there or, or that spore out there, I guess, that like there's a lot of work to be done in the, in the breeding and culturing realm. And we need folks in that element of the industry. They may never actually produce fresh mushrooms or mushroom products for market. Uh -huh. we're, right now we're front loading that industry in terms of, or back ending it, I guess. We're, we're, we're getting a lot more growers showing up producing that final product but as we march back through the production chain there's a big gap it's it's analogous to seed savers right it's analogous yeah. to the folks that aren't focused on growing vegetables but are focused on saving high quality seed so there's lots of opportunities in the whole kind of production chain to get involved and if someone's of you know interest and in, in, in skill set you know meets that meets that need so let's see what are we this is some life cycle pictures Sorry, that right wanna... there is fabulous. Um, you know, Great. yeah, it's right there. Talk about this. Cool. No, I'm happy to do that. I'm sorry. I'm making some assumptions that you all are, you know, into, we're, we're probably exploring lots of different dimensions of this. So, um, this is mycelium from wine cap Straferia, Uh, and we did research with this for a couple seasons, looking at different wood chip, wood chip materials and, and layering techniques. And, and again, different strains. We, we bought strains from, um, from four different companies and we trialed them on beds right next to each other and we got four entirely different results in terms of yield and even in terms of survivability so some of the strains it was it was kind of an average year actually the years we did it there wasn't any kind of abnormalities in terms of moisture or anything like that 
but it really just showed us that strain matters. And we had strains from, you know, our climate all the way down into like Georgia, Florida area. And so there were some noticeable differences in performance. And I think that's a really important take home from that. But I really like to show this mycelial picture because this, you know, wine cap has some of those visible mycelia. You can actually see those individual threads, you know, wrapping in and around and through the digesting of the chips. Now, what time of year can you inoculate the wine cap? Can that, how late in the year can you do that? I would say anytime you can give it at least three or four weeks to get established, I think you're good. Um, and that would be three or four weeks before it really seems like most mycelium needs at least like a 55 degree you know, Fahrenheit temperature, great, you know, average, like it can swing up and down, but it kind of needs to hover in that range to, to grow. It'll grow slow, but it'll still grow. Now, there was actually a class I did once in November and I was trying to demonstrate wine cap, but it was a little too cold to do it outside. So we layered this, we did a layer of compost, sawdust, hardwood sawdust. We layered the mycelium and then we put wood chips on top, just in like a clear plastic tote, like maybe 12 yep. inches by 24 inches. And I took it home and I like stuck it under my bed, kind of forgot about it. And a month later, the whole thing was, of course, covered in mycelium. And I took that one bin and then I divided that into six more bins. And I did this all winter. By the end of the winter, I had like 50 bins full of mycelium. And so I work a lot with folks in New York City, you know, in small spaces. And I just encourage people to say, you know, in the wintertime, you can always grow out your mycelium. You can get a little bag of spawn grow it out. And because that spring I was ready to go in every single planting space, I put that one little, you know, pocket of mycelium became, you know, much to my wife's chagrin of having 50, <laughs> 50 yeah. tons of mycelium in the closet. But, but yeah, I would say otherwise, you know, in New York state, for instance, uh, we, we can definitely get it established anywhere from like early May through, through pretty late in October. And I think it's still a pretty good bet. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. Very cool. Uh, here's some pins of shiitake on logs. Uh, one comment I'll make on this this aspect that I think is a really important thing from a production standpoint is that this point in the log's life when it's fruiting is a is a real pivotal point, and and we're still we still have a lot of research questions that maybe someday we'll answer around what happens when it's too hot or too dry or even too moist when the log has gone from the soaking because shiitake logs are soaked in tanks for 24 hours. You pull that log out and between that time and when this pin shows up, which is usually three to five days, you know, on average, there's a lot of things that can happen that we're seeing uh, with climate change are actually causing them to abort and either barely pin or not pin at all. And one of the things I've noticed very consistently is when I pull logs out and it's 90, 95 degrees for several days after they often don't pin. They might pin actually a few weeks later. So there's some interactions there going on that we, we often haven't paid attention to. We've always said, oh, you just soak the log, take it out, and it's good to go. But we're finding with the variability in seasons, that's not always the case. So this it's really important these pins also don't get exposed to a lot of wind or a lot of dry air because it seems like it can really arrest their development into mushrooms. So that, that that's that's a question that we don't have a full answer to, but it's certainly something that we're starting to see. When we did our research initially, it really wasn't an issue. It just seemed like it was pretty, pretty consistent. So, some questions there with maybe how the how the climate's uh, affecting things, you know? Yeah. Now I'm seeing in that there's two bits of wax in that picture too. That picture you were showing, the the wax right almost underneath it, and then there's a line of wax in the mm -hmm. front. Is it a totem or? Mm -hmm. No, this was just a close up of a log. My guess. I mean, that's that's definitely fruiting right out of the hole that it was inoculated in, which often in the first year, they, they come right out of there. I bet the other wax is either somebody nicked the log or just dripped wax. Gotcha. <laughs> Made a mess, that sort of thing. Yeah. This is, you know, obviously a mature shiitake, which really is in most cases happening. Uh, usually after we pulled the logs out of the tank, it's usually around seven to, to 10 days, at least in the New York climate. Although we've seen it as quickly as four or five days when it's really hot. And we had some this fall. We, we soaked a lot later than normal because it was staying warm, but still dipping really into cooler temperatures at night. And um, we had some mushrooms that took almost two weeks to, to fully mature. And they did, they did beautiful uh, under that. So the key here to, to notice in this cap is the curled edge underneath the, the fruity mushroom itself. I get a lot of pictures from new growers who send me these like pancake mushrooms and that like flat cap right and 
once that cap is flat, that actually is mature. But what happens is the edge is completely flimsy. And from a business standpoint, you can't throw five or 10 pounds of those into a bag or a box and not have them get destroyed and look terrible, you know, even 24 hours after you put them in the fridge. And so we really emphasize with our growers a lot. You want to really harvest them when that cap edge is still curled and well formed so that they can, they can stand up to, to the inevitable, you know, bouncing and beating around they're going to have in storage. And it can really make the difference between, between uh, making a sale or not. So can I sell these mushrooms fresh five days after I've harvested them or are they now going into the value added pile or the, the pile that I eat because they just don't look very good. So one of the challenging things of indoor and outdoor mushroom farming is you got to check on your mushrooms pretty frequently. It's not a, an eight hour day. It's a, it's a, it's a daily task that might be less than an hour or might be a, you know, a smaller amount of time, I guess is what I'm saying, but, but yeah. pretty frequent, sometimes two or three times a day. Um, yeah, so we yeah. try to keep our logs and, and everything really close to home. Yeah. Yeah, you want to be in there every couple hours some days, just checking on, you know, when those caps just start to flare a bit, you got to get those mushrooms harvested. Yeah. They don't go uh, get poor quality like you were saying. Yeah, and I, 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 the only thing I'll say about spore prints is we've gotten more and more pictures into the into our office, especially from outdoor shiitake growers being like, well, what is this thing? It looks kind of like a shiitake, but I don't think it is. And it's made us realize that while when you inoculate a fresh log, you're almost guaranteed to get a shiitake, what happens is the log deteriorates is sometimes other things will show up. And they can sometimes look like a brown mushroom with a white stem and have some of those characteristics. Um, so we're emphasizing more and more that growers take an identification course, learn identification, make sure they can they can sort of prove that. It's not as much of a concern with the indoor systems, but but it's a concern for markets. If you can't um, describe confidently how you how you can discern the mushrooms you grow from some potential lookalike, people's phobia might catch up with you. Farmers market, you know, agencies might have questions around. We've gotten all this kind of stuff from growers where they say, my, my farmer's market won't actually let me grow sell here because they're concerned I don't know how to identify mushrooms. So I think being really well-versed in the process and, and able to really explain the differences between the mushrooms you're growing and other potential contaminants is a really important kind of part of your, your business development. And obviously very important if, if you're selling any foraged mushrooms. Now in New York state, we have a process for certification and more and more states are getting into that process so that people can, can have taken a test and show that they, they have you know confidence in, in proper identification, things like that. And, and one of our, our, Fearful lookalikes would be the Gallerina um, species that could show up on old, we've seen them on old shiitake logs. Um, so just as an example, the spore print would really, without a doubt, distinguish the shiitake from, from Gallerina because the spore prints are completely opposite. And generally a rusty brown or brown spore print is a sign of something that's probably not something you want to eat. There's not a lot of edible, choice edible species that have that. So so if you don't know that and, and you throw a log in the woods, um, we can see these kind of things pop up and that can be problematic if you haven't trained a yourself or an employee to, to know the difference and pick it, you can throw it in the basket and it could be a good problematic thing. I show this to a lot of folks who get in the mushrooms first because they often just go and, and buy the buy the bag of spawn. But just to be clear that we have a you know a kind of part of an industry and we don't all have to be spawn producers. And I think a big uh, challenge new growers get into, especially from a business perspective, is they try to both produce the fruiting mushrooms as well as produce all their own spawn. And I think that can add a lot of labor and a lot of infrastructure and a lot of learning curve to the enterprise. So I'd encourage people to, if your goal is to sell you know, fresh mushrooms or products made from the fruiting bodies of mushrooms, to focus your enterprise first on growing really high quality fresh mushrooms and leaning a bit heavy on the industry to, to provide the materials for you to do that. And then if you want to build in more layers, like if you want to okay, I've fruited these lines made. Now I want to produce the spawn to fruit these lines made. If you want to work back through the process, that's great. But uh, I see a lot of folks try to do the whole process from, you know, culturing to, to master creation to spawn production to fruiting, and it can be very exhausting. Uh, and you can run into all sorts of, of challenges. So, yeah, so, so uh, we did a lot of work with this at, at Cornell. We had some grad students um, back in the day. This slide set is actually specifically from a grad student's work where she harvested a local lion's mane strain. She found two local strains out in the woods, and she compared them to two um, strains that she could she could buy commercially. And she was interested in totems uh, specifically. So she took the wild strains, she cultured them, 
inoculated sterilized grain, then grew them out in sawdust spawn, and then inoculated those stumps alongside totems that she had done with the, the, the um, spawn that she could, you know, was commercially available. And she found that the yields were actually better. This is, again, in central New York. The, the mushrooms that she harvested and propagated from central New York, the yields were quite a bit better than the ones from the commercially available strains, which are from other parts of the country. So it's kind of an interesting thing, again, back to that idea of needing more you know, adaptive breeding work to be done because we might actually be able to increase our odds of success. We might actually be able to breed a lion's mane that, you know, fruits two or three times a season if we, if we started to play with it and might do that outdoors, which could be really fun. But that's probably that sentence is someone's lifetime of work, which I, <laughs> I would love to see somebody do, but that's interesting in and of itself. So what we have available, available out there is not always the best for, for our circumstance, um, particularly with outdoor stuff. A lot of the Strains that you buy are, are strains that are developed for indoor growing, and they don't always perform as well outdoors. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons in this experiment she found the wild harvesty stuff to do a bit better. So what we focus on with our extension work and, and encouraging people if they're starting an enterprise is really to, to ground their production system on either or both of these uh, species and production systems. So the long grown shiitake and then the oysters on either straw or, or sawdust. And, and then you can go in any direction you want from there. But if, it, if your goal is really uh, an enterprise, I think those systems really have a lot of opportunity, a lot of robustness in terms of the strains available. And we can really pencil out good budgets and, and start to build markets and, and then kind of like turn the dial up or down in terms of how we want to supply that market, which is really important too. Because you, you might in your head say, I want to produce 100 pounds a week. But then you realize, actually, that's too much. I want to do 50 pounds a week. And, and both of these, you can really you can start to adjust that pretty quickly to, to, meet, to meet your needs as well as the market needs. Shiitake, I, I, if folks aren't aware, one of the reasons that it's so reliably cultivated outdoors, it's the only one that really consistently does it, is this miraculous relationship between soaking the log in a tank of water and it actually forcing the mushrooms to fruit. And it's still a phenomenon that no one can fully explain but one that is, is, is very reliable and, and consistent. And what we do know is a couple of things about the water. We know the colder the water, the better, and the cleaner the water, the better. Those will actually improve the yields, but it's not going to work to sprinkle them or hose them down. It really has to be them submerged in water. We always stay 24 hours, but we've found growers have said anywhere from eight to 20 hours can also work. So that's something to play with, but that's the magic of, of the log itself and how it produces. And there's, there's, there's a similar effect that happens with the blocks indoors as well. You can soak them to kind of reinvigorate the mycelium. So you're also saying that even like turning a misting system on doesn't work. They have to be submerged underwater to make it work. Yeah. Yeah. We did a, a multi-year research project to see if what the yields look like from basically not doing anything, watering them through a sprinkling system, misting system, or, or soaking them. And you'll get mushrooms on e any of those scenarios, but you will not get them at the volume or consistency if you don't submerge them in water. Gotcha. So do you have people that have like put the logs on racks so they can get them in, in and out of the water easily? Or how, how do you scale this? Is it even possible? Yeah, I mean, that's a choice. I really value, uh, I mentioned too, because we do the indoor production, I really value the physical activity of loading up. We, we, we load up, a, we have, this is a really small stock tank, right? We have a, a stainless steel tank that fits about 150 logs. We fill that up every week. You know, it takes us 45 minutes or so. I really enjoy the work, so I'm fine with that. But certainly I've seen people build racks that they can like basically lower. I've seen uh, folks in... Um, Martha's Vineyard had a farm where they, they built frames and actually used dumpsters as their water tank and just kind of oh. raised and lowered them. I also thought there's an awesome grower in the Hudson Valley. I don't know if they're still doing it, but they built, they had an irrigation pond built for their veg operation and they incorporated basically like a, a, a ramp and they would pull this wagon around into their woods. They'd load it up with logs and strap them down with ratchet straps. And they they back the trailer into the pond, <laughs> you know, 24 hours. Then they pull it out, and then they pull it back in the woods, and then they just stand up all the logs. They have this little rack system that you know, like yeah. you know, pop the logs up. And so that that was genius, you know. What I mean, that really worked. With I mean, they happened to you know also. I don't know if you could justify building a pond just to soak shiitakes, but they were also using it for their irrigation. So it was all part of their farm system. Yeah. And, 
it saves them a lot of labor. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Yeah. So always up for yeah creative things, and and then they'll probably be the rest of us who are happy just to kind of move them around, <laughs> get the exercise in. Yeah. But certainly it limits. Yeah. I mean, we run about twelve hundred logs in this system. Um, you could probably with human labor maybe max out at like five thousand, but if you want to get much beyond that, it would be hard to um, probably do it by hand. Mm -hmm. Although I will say I visited the largest shiitake farm at the time that I knew of when I wrote the Farming the Woods book, and uh, it was in uh, was, uh, Missouri, I'm blanking on the name, but they, they had 18,000 logs in production. It was all done by hand. Wow. Uh, I mean, they used, they used like tractors with forks, and they just loaded them up by hand and kind of drove them over and unloaded them. But what was beautiful about that is they, they employed six or eight folks, you know, full time to run this mushroom business. and. So where, where we have inefficiencies from a mechanical standpoint, we have jobs, <laughs> you know, so it depends on, on what you want to do. You know, this is a, a slide just, just to summarize with the outdoor system. I really like to emphasize that we can really link the folks have woodlands on their farms or are curious about what, what they can do with their woods in a sense. Um, we can really link good forest management to, to mushroom log production, which I think is a huge benefit. Of course, all materials in mushroom production have a link to forestry uh, one way or the other, but we really like the quality of the shiitakes coming off the logs and the fact that other than the energy that goes into the spawn production, which is off-site for us, and the energy that we use to actually inoculate, you know, for three years after that initial energy investment, there's zero, there's not an energy bill other than human time and labor. And I really like that compared to, you know, the temperature modification, the humidity modification, the electricity all needed to maintain this indoor system all the time. And of course we do both. So we have, we see the pros and cons of both, but that's a beautiful setup for the logs. It's a really unique thing to have essentially no outside energy once you get them, once you get them going. As we talked about, the biggest challenges are space and labor and, and that soaking piece um, for them. So our website and our project has done a lot of work with the economics. Um, you can download budget tools and actually plug and play your own scenarios and look at how you might phase in for both like indoor shiitake and, or excuse me, outdoor shiitake and the indoor, you know, oyster cultivation. You can kind of plug and play and see what the numbers generate, which is nice. We've done extensive research with farmers. So we learned from a grant back in 2010 that about over half the energy that goes into shiitake operations for outdoor logs goes into just felling the trees and inoculating them. And that's significant because, again, there's kind of this upfront labor investment and then much less on the on the, the back end of just the fruiting harvest and sales of the mushrooms. And so these are kind of the, the summaries of the averages of what we found so it's nice to be able to tell someone, well, it's going to cost you a little under $5 per log. A bolt is another name for a log. And you'll get about $15 back on that log over, over three years. It's a, it's a pretty decent margin. So it's like it's some summary things. There's, of course, a lot of variables. This, this is an average. We found some people are just like super slow <laughs> and take a lot more time, you know. And so it, it, and, and so not everyone made a profit in our, in our study uh, out of the 25 growers that we worked with. But, but certainly on average, it seemed like a, a pretty promising outcome and i think we can learn a lot from the people who have been doing this for a long time this is a this is a screenshot from a video that maybe we could link to i don't know if there's notes with this presentation but i could send you the link Absolutely. there's a really wonderful series called woodlanders and woodlanders has a is a friend of mine who's a filmmaker and has traveled the world did a project where he documented a lot of different sort of traditional human woodland relationships and sort of the ways people were still earning a living from the land. And so he, he actually got to go to Japan and film and, and watch and observe some of the shiitake farms there where sometimes these farms are growing on like a million logs in these mountainous regions where the rainfall is really high. They actually don't often soak their logs because there's like 80 inches of rainy air. And so the, the, the logs just passively fruit and they're just, combing through these stacks and stacks and, and harvesting mushrooms. Almost 100% of the mushrooms harvested in these systems are dried immediately. And that's partially because these are in very rural areas and the markets are in very you know, more urban centers and things like that. And so drying them becomes essential to get them to market. So there's some you know, kind of interesting things to think about there, um, some lessons to learn and, and and just some awe for the for the scale of these types of systems. Another really cool thing is these are managed on mostly on 
coppiced agroforestry systems, which means the oak trees, um, sawtooth oak is the most common species used there, are grown on a 15 or 20 year rotation. They're cut down in small clear cuts and then they're allowed to regenerate and then they grow their logs again. And so a, it, this is, in some places has been going on for three or 400 years, this type of production system, which is pretty pretty amazing. So very sustainable in that, in that line. But they're, they're, they're actually produced for mushrooms. That's what these, the, the, the woodland is managed for. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, and because those, you know, they're, they're, maybe they'll clear like half, a half acre at a time or something. Yeah. Those new logs are grown in open sunlight. And so they're a hundred percent sapwood and uh, likely could be almost twice as productive as the logs that we're harvesting out of our woods, which, you know, are stressed, <laughs> suppressed trees yeah. that were, you know, are half heartwood, dead wood, essentially. So there's a lot more water and nutrients in those logs. We haven't done a study to compare the wood, but certainly those open grown logs are, you know, have a lot more productive capacity just from that kind of, yeah. Well, we know about the biology. So I started growing oysters myself on the, the picture on the left there is on coffee grounds, just in my kitchen, adding, you know, the French press of, of grounds every day and, and throwing in some spawn. And that was, that was all well and good um, until inevitably the mold, mold hit, which is what will often happen with those kind of indoor experiments. And a lot of folks ask about, can I just grow on straight coffee grounds? And, and the answer is kind of, you know, for a moment in time, you can often get like a little bit of success, but generally speaking, that material is way too nutritive, has way too much nutrition. And so two problems happen that one, it actually slows the mycelial growth of the oyster because it's like, it's almost like eating something that's just like too thick for your, your palate. So you really have to like slow down and digest it. And then the other problem is it's so, it's so high nutritive that um, other things contaminate it really easily. And so compete essentially with the mycelium for that, for that food source. So on our website, um, one of the things we have is uh, we do monthly webinars and we had one grower who did a great research project where she looked at different percentages of coffee grounds she was adding to her sawdust medium. So she hmm. tried 10%, 25%, 50%, 75%, and I think like hundred percent. And she found that basically over 50% was a, was a problematic mixture of coffee it's just too much too much nutrient uh, too many too many nutrients and so she was feeling like around i think it was around 25 percent was was the optimal at the end of the day you know so if you have and and, and a big desire is because people feel like they have access to coffee grounds as a source and that can be great but it, can, keep in mind that falls into the category of like supplements what we're mainly wanting to grow these mushrooms on is a carbon rich material which is where the straw or sawdust or wood pellets come in so the bags on the left or the right there are, are straw bags and any straw will do. And straw is, is the material left over after harvesting seed. So hay, hay would have the seed and all the other bits and be rather green. And the straw is usually wheat or rye or something like that. And um, so it's just the, essentially just the cellulose, just the carbon. And that's what we use in our, in our cultivation. We don't want um, to ever use hay or anything like that. And What's really important with your substrate is it's ideally pretty uniform and consistent, both in its size and texture and, and consistency. So hay is also a problem because it's mostly a mixture of different grasses or uh, some mixture of grasses and flowering plants and whatever's in the pasture. And that um, does not translate very well to a uniform mix that you can grow mushrooms on reliably. So wherever you're at in the world, the question is, what are the substrates I can get my hands on? reliably and consistently and what's the recipe that I'm going to create that works for me and then what what oysters best fit that recipe so not all oyster strains do well on straw and not all oyster strains do well on whatever mix you come up with so um, so a lot of this is recipe formulation and trying to figure that out um, as you go so we work a lot now with this project. Uh, we expanded from our outdoor system to, to focus on this. And one of the main reasons is because um, we recognize that um, growing in small and especially like within urban agriculture, we work a lot in the city. Um, there actually are a lot of folks in New York City that want to grow shiitakes on logs and find that really appealing. But there's also a lot of space uh, potential for, for growing. Some people don't have the patience or the desire to wait a year for those shiitake logs and then kind of the, the cycle that can be a little slower. And so 
to go from zero to, to fruiting in three or four weeks is, is a remarkable piece of the oyster infrastructure from a business standpoint that, that I think is really helpful. You could really ramp up pretty quickly. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily call these cons. Uh, they're, they're just they're just challenges. They're inputs that we have to recognize. And, and the, the difference between um, what we've talked about so far is the outdoor stuff to the indoor is really, as I've said, this kind of jump into being kind of part engineer and plumber and, you know, really monitoring the environment. And I would say, uh, <laughs> like, geeking out and having fun with it, too, because it's really constantly like, oh, let me go in and, like, play with this thing and figure out what's going on and okay, I figured it out for spring and now it's summer and now everything's changed because the building is being heated up that much quicker. Or now our building's in winter mode and so it's really easy to keep it at 55 degrees, but if I wanted it to be 70, it would be asking a lot. Um, and so there's lots of great creative strategies if we cycle what types of mushrooms we're growing. We can take a break from production. You know, There's different ways we can work with that, but just to recognize you're in constant relationship with the environment. <laughs> when you're growing shiitake logs, you're basically just enjoying the woods providing that natural environment. Um, but I often kind of reflect back on like what the woods does, what, what it provides for these mushrooms, because that's ultimately where they came from. And so what are the elements of that that we're basically bringing into more of like a synthetic you know, type of environment? So oysters are great because people can get a lot of success early on. And there's so much variation to play with. What we find, though, from a commercial standpoint, is people people throw a lot of things at the wall, and they realize really quickly that they need to, to hone in on just a few species. And even with an oyster, people have really strong opinions, for instance, about like these pink and yellow oysters. If I find that growers who sell at like farmers markets or farm stands where they want to draw people's eye in, those mushrooms are really popular. But folks who are selling mostly wholesale or restaurant, they're they're not very popular. And the reason is because they, they're, they're pretty flimsy. Um, they don't hold up as well in storage as compared, especially like the blue or gray oysters do, or the king oysters or things like that. And so, uh, but a pink food will inevitably, you know, get somebody excited to come check your, yeah. your stand out. So those are actually factors that have nothing to do with cultivation, but have everything to do with the market. And so it's good to play, but then to think about, okay, what are the one or two I'm going to kind of focus in on that, that meet, meet my goals and my customers seem to really like, you know, as you go there. So we're, we're currently working on the economics. So we're engaged both with, I'm partnering with Willie Crosby from Fungi Ally um, on a project with some growers who are collecting data, as well as the data that we're generating from our own um, simulations. Essentially on campus, we have we have essentially like growth chambers, which really just means areas that we can easily control the temperature and humidity. And then we can just grow out mushrooms and see what some of the, the yields are. So we're kind of, uh -huh. a lot of the estimates out there are, are sort of broad ranges. And so we really wanted to see what, what we were getting from different production systems and different temperatures. And so we'll, I'd say these, these, these cost summaries are sort of um, good estimates based on grower experience, but we're trying to refine those down into something a little more data driven and that that should be out in the next you know year or two we can start to plug some real numbers in, which is great. So it, it really in a very small space you can generate a, definitely a lot more income if we compare it to the logs in a you know dollars per square foot kind of ratio um, or or people often want to compare the pound of log to the pound of straw or sawdust. It's really just not comparable. From that perspective, but again, there's other benefits because you don't you're not paying for the energy, for instance, to go in there and do that. And I don't I've never had a contamination issue with our logs, <laughs> but I've certainly had a lot of a lot of fun little molds and bugs and all sorts of things show up in the fruiting room, and that you know that's a nightmare. That's a real challenge that you have to be on top of. So I think a lot of enterprise growers don't tell people from the from the starting point that you spend a lot of time cleaning. It's like yes. Yeah. That's like the majority of your work. <laughs> well, even if you have a very small, because we just turned on our, our room and our room set up that we'll be able to do 500 pounds a week if we want. Mm -hmm. uh, but we literally had a dozen blocks in there, the 12 pound blocks. And just, again, it was our first, just throw some in, make sure our parameters are looking good. And literally our fan, our ducts already have a coating of spores on from just those 12 blocks. Yeah. Blew me away. Yeah. So we made that miss, you know, we, we installed our fans to be uninstallable. Like we couldn't easily take them down and hose them out. And now, you know, we've obviously changed all that so we can. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I have a lot of the young folks come to me and they're like, Oh, I really want to grow mushrooms. And they're like, Oh, I didn't realize that 
three quarters of it was cleaning stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that's a big factor to keep in mind, obviously. And, and the more steps in the process you get involved with. So if you're just doing fruiting blocks, you have to do a lot less cleaning than if you also inoculate. And you have to do even less, more cleaning if you also, you know, produce your own spawn and things like that, because it requires that. So, yeah, just a couple, let me show a couple pictures here. Yeah, so, so we've talked a bit about kind of combining either sawdust or, or wood pellets is now becoming really common because people can source those and they're really consistent. Or the straw itself. The straw really needs to be shredded. And then you can start playing with supplements and figuring out that recipe again. But it's usually a majority for sure of this kind of carbon-rich base um, with, with whatever you're working with. And the straw, one of the advantages is we don't have to sterilize it fully in order to clean it. So nothing that you do indoors can be done without somewhat preparing the substrate by doing two things. One is hydrating it to make sure it's at the right moisture level. And the other is clearing it of other microbes and contaminants that might compete with your mycelium. And one of the reasons we start with oysters is because it's so vigorous, it grows really fast, so you can overcome some of those contaminants. If you start off and you try to grow lion's mane, you'll probably have a lot of failures because it grows a lot slower. Uh, same with shiitake on, on indoor systems. And, and so um, better to start with something that's a little more resilient and then kind of expand to those other species like I was referring to before. So um, you're going to have to clean it. And the question is how clean and and how contaminated because you're not you cannot eliminate um, contamination it will happen it will show up the question is can you create a scenario where the mycelium is out competing the contamination to the point where it's established in the material and then can can fruit and continue on its life cycle so we've played with these different techniques we call these the low-tech techniques because we're not fully sterilizing the material sometimes these are called pasteurization techniques you can cook your your straw again in you know in water for a couple hours at the at the temperatures what we usually do when we do this is just heat up a barrel of 55 gallon drum of water it holds about one straw bale we heat it up to 180 degrees and then we turn off the the heat source we cap it and it stays at that temperature range for about two hours and then we pull the material out and inoculate it cold fermentation or cold pasteurization is basically just sitting the stuff in water and it gets stinky and you eliminate a lot of the oxygen loving microbial activity that can be the source of your contamination. So that's the lowest tech. You could be dropped anywhere on earth and, uh, you know, inoculate something using that, which is pretty great. The pH uh, can be raised in your material. We do a lot with the lime. Uh, this is not uh, your common agricultural lime. It's, it's a different material called hydrated Mason's lime. And it's really important you source a lime product that is, has less than 10% magnesium in it it doesn't actually tend to work if it has too high of a magnesium uh, count. So that is all dependent on what your local source is. So our local feed store, the, the hydrated Mason's lime they carry, happens to have a less than 10% magnesium. And that's because of the quarry that it's mined from. So lime is mined from limestone, pulverized, and heated to a high temperature in order to prepare it. And that's, um, that's the material. And so our last option is using hydrogen peroxide. There's actually a series of guidebooks online that talk about this. I haven't done a lot with this, and mostly it's because of the cost of the material can be can be expensive unless you can source it from some kind of lab supply or something like that. But I've heard good results as well. So again, we do these when we do them. We do them on the we have a, a 200 gallon stainless steel tank. So that's kind of our scale of production. If you're playing with these, I'd recommend trying them on a like a five gallon bucket scale, do little micro batches and see, see what works and what makes sense. And there's no right way to do it. Although we did have, uh, again, Willie Crosby has a nice guidebook on his website about straw inoculation. And one of the things he did is a, a small grant where he compared, I think they used lime or excuse me, wood ash. I can't remember if they used wood ash or lime. They did one of the pH treatments, they did the cold ferment and they did the heat treatment. And they found that the lime, I think it was the lime and the heat treatment were about equal in their success. So um, they found the cold ferment had kind of a mixed bag of, of results. So, so that kind of thinking, I think what's important is try them out, see what works for you, do that cost benefit analysis because they all have kind of their different pros and cons. You know, as you go. Hydrogen peroxide seems like that would be a little bit more expensive. Well, that's, yeah, exactly. That's, that was my main thing is there, and like I said, there's like a whole guidebook series online with this, these folks who are really fanatical about it. And, I put it on there because it might be an option for people. But yeah, I think it's probably one of the most expensive on this list. Um, yeah. So 
So, and then of course, what we're seeing in the in the kind of small enterprise is people playing with with sterilization. And if you if you're going to get into wood pellets or sawdust as your main base material, you're going to want to sterilize your material, which means bringing it to at least 200 um, degrees Fahrenheit for between one and two hours. And a lot of small growers start with just pressure canners, like the, the photo on the right there, usually an electric pressure canner where you can set the, the time and temperature and walk away. This would this would be one you put on a gas stove and have to monitor, which is a little more of a pain. That's, that's what we do when we do small batches of things. It's fine. And then we're seeing these kind of uh, barrel sterilizers or trough sterilizers showing up, which is really Interesting. This is uh, on the left is uh, they call this a Bubba's barrel. This is um, now manufactured in Eric Myers of Myers Mushrooms. I don't know if he's involved with the summit, but really great guy to follow and learn from. He's really open to share a lot about his uh, learning journey about building this. And so he built one of these long ago, sort of from scratch, provided all the materials. You can definitely build a DIY, but you can also just buy it as a, as a prefab unit now that this, um, this like a uh, brewery uh, supply company manufactures called Bubba's Barrel. But I've seen folks use uh, livestock troughs or, you know, old tanks, things like that. And what they're generally either doing, usually this is what we call atmospheric steam. So we're just injecting steam into the material for somewhere between 10 and 20 hours. And so the difference between these two is that you have on the right, you have a pressurized system, which can be done much quicker, but with atmospheric steam, which would be not under pressure, you have to do that steam injection for a much longer time. And so there's, of course, pros and cons to that. So, so on our farm, we do a hybrid. We do some straw oysters with the lime method. And then we also use a steam. We have a saw on a steamer that we inject into the same tank and we can steam straw that way pretty effectively, but we can also steam bags of sawdust or, or wood pellets. So, you know, our approach has been to think about um, how to set ourselves up for kind of multiple options for treatment, because we don't actually know, you know, if our local supplier is always going to have that line, or if um, electricity is going to get really expensive and we don't want to, you know, steam something for 20 hours. So for us, you know, diversity and versatility is really key. And it's good to have at least a couple options. You know, what happens if you're your steamer breaks down, you don't have any other options. Nice to have some lime there so you can still do an inoculation that week, that sort of thing. So this was from Willie's guidebook, just to show you like the, the most simple heat sterilizer I've seen, just a turkey fryer on some, you know, under some cinder blocks, you have a 55 gallon drum and you could, you could start to produce um, straw bags this way very easily. Um, it doesn't require a lot. Another farm set up, you know, very simple, very basic ways to do this. And so with straw, you can get away with sort of this kind of setup, which we call the barn inoculation, where you can do this inoculation under low or no st sterility type conditions. And that's because the straw generally is just not as interesting to a lot of the com competitive microbials. And so you can kind of inoculate in open air, stuff it in the bags, and you get good success if you get these into a, an incubation space pretty soon. When you're using sterile medium, the, the cleaner you make your material, the more you have to then keep it clean. And so you could not inoculate sawdust bags in this kind of setup. You would need to take them inside in some kind of room with that's nice and clean and usually with a, a flow hood or something that's, that's blowing clean sterile air at you as you're doing your inoculation. So there's an interesting, I think, uh, conversation for many years that's gone on with this, this notion. A lot of mushroom cultivation came from essentially microbial work in laboratories and so the assumption is we have to be really sterile and and yet mushrooms come from uh, nature come from the woods which is probably the least sterile environment so when we create hyper sterile conditions we also create really uh, good cracks in the window so to speak for micro you know for contaminants to show up so then we have to up our game and keep things even more sterile so people are definitely trying to figure out how dirty can things be and still work? Because that actually might make the work easier in the long term, if that makes sense. Another way to think of this is that when we fruit mushrooms in a really clean room, they don't have to defend themselves from competitors. And what's actually happening is they're not producing as many bacterial enzymes, not bacterial enzymes, as many defensive enzymes to defend against competitors. And, and that might actually be the, the compounds that uh, produce a lot of the medicinal benefits that mushrooms uh, provide. Uh, those exudates from fruiting bodies are in direct response to competitive environments. And so when we grow mushrooms in a very sterile space, we may not be getting those, those full 
the, the mushrooms to actually do those those things and so we may not actually be getting the full range of medicinal benefits um just some just to mention these things is like interesting side conversations that i see happening in the community around it so so i encourage growers to play with the the, the sterile continuum <laughs> and start off with following the protocols that people recommend, but then think about things as you go and make some considerations along the way about where you could fall on that, on that continuum. This is a monastery in, in South Carolina. They do a lot of mushroom. They actually fund most of their operations, their, their monastery through mushroom sales. And I just, I just always love to show this picture because this is a simple straw inoculation on a pool liner. It's pretty cool. I don't know. I don't remember the name of it, but that's, um, Really simple setups, not not super sterile, just whatever kind of repurposed buildings they have, that sort of thing. And that's really, again, the big advantage to straw is you can work with the space you have versus having to feel, feel fully outfit it to be, to be cleaned and things like that. Last thing I'll mention is just to, to clarify for folks to be thinking about when you're doing indoor production, we're really talking about three things. So we've talked a little bit about inoculation. There's a million different details we could continue to talk about, but... We'll leave that aside for now. But after that inoculation, there's there's two different phases of growth. One is incubation and the other is fruiting. And this is generally what the kind of parameters we're looking for for oyster production in these two scenarios. And incubation, if you're doing inoculation, is where contamination is of highest concern. When we're when the mushrooms have gotten to the phase of fruiting, we're not actually that concerned with contamination. We're more concerned with potential pests that might show up in the fruiting room, like um, like mites or flies or things like that. But the molds and contaminants that can really shut down production really show up in that either the inoculation or the incubation phase. So what I've found over time, we used to try to incubate in a, in a pretty hack space that was not very easy to clean, um, that we couldn't keep the temperature very consistent in. Uh, it fluctuated both in terms of light and temperature. And your biggest challenger in this space is, is trichoderma, is, is this blue-green mold that shows up on a lot of things that you've inoculated if you haven't done it well. And trichoderma, as it turns out, when I dug deeper into the research, thrives in two conditions, variable temperature and variable light conditions. So you really basically want a very uh, consistently cool, around 65, 70 degrees is ideal, and pretty dark space for incubation. So farms uh, that don't want to build out a full kind of mushroom house can... Think about a space like a shipping container that they insulate or something like that. That's basically uh, something they can keep very consistent, both in terms of light and temperature, and that could be your incubation. And then fruiting can be done in a lot of different types of spaces because we do want a little bit of ambient light. We do want to increase the humidity. And then we play with our temperatures based on the, the types of mushrooms we're trying to fruit, as I alluded to before. Some like it. Most mushrooms, uh, most of the species we want, do fine in the 65 to 75 range, but some like a little cooler and some can tolerate it a bit warmer than that. With fruiting, also fresh air circulation is really important. So incubation spaces are not generally very exciting. They're usually, like I said, kind of dark closets that have a very consistent low temperature. Fruiting spaces, I've seen everything from high tunnels to greenhouses to literally outside to shipping containers to, you know, all sorts of different things. So, so there's a lot more uh, room to play in that space. One consideration for new growers is that you can do what's called ready to fruit blocks and you can start off your production by purchasing what are called ready to fruit blocks which are from spawn suppliers. So when you buy spawn to inoculate that's a slightly different composition. It's usually just straight sawdust because the intention is you're going to take that and put it into something more nutritive and inoculate that and that'll grow your mushrooms. But ready to fruit blocks are essentially Supplement sawdust blocks that are ready, ready to fruit. And so you're going to pay, pay a little bit more, more cost, but you're going to have a product that's skipping all the steps and just going right to the fruiting phase. And so from an enterprise perspective, this is a big advantage because you can either start your enterprise with just fruiting and focus on learning that part of the system. And then you can kind of step back and say, okay, now I want to do some inoculation and incubation. Or if you have a shortfall or some kind of issue, you could buy in blocks in order to supplement your harvest you know while you get some other part of the system worked out that's a that's a pretty unique component to this there's not a lot of other agriculture you know if i have a sheep issue i can't just go and buy buy some sheep to replace you know the ones i'm missing um in the short term so and we know we have mushroom operations that just wholesale ready to fruit blocks and they focus on the fruiting and the sales of the mushrooms 
And that's certainly an option for folks, whether that helps them get started or as a way to sustain their sustain their enterprise. So some new publications that are on our website, and so I'm gonna show you to kind of wrap up the presentation, uh, get into these kind of different stages. And it's really important, again, for a new grower to consider, do I wanna be involved in all of these or maybe just one of these stages or maybe two of these and really think through the different components. And there's, there's an incredible amount of options, I guess, in, in choosing your own adventure and combining these different things. Um, so this is just, uh, this, the short link to this is Cornell Mushrooms. Dot org and this is uh, hosted by the Cornell Small Farms program but if you go to that link you'll find all the mushroom related material so just want to show you a couple things so you're aware of what's available for your ongoing uh, learning as 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 you might choose in your mushroom journey if you scroll down our home page you'll find this series of buttons and we're in the process of potentially changing some of these so these might change but there'll be always these these kind of uh, categories uh, and, and areas for you to, to dive into here we do like i mentioned production research on campus and with growers we do a number of different educational events sometimes in person often online we have two online courses they start first one starts in january it's focused on all the outdoor mushroom cultivation and then following that we have the indoor mushroom course and so that features a number of guests and you can you can really dive deep and again it's a, it's a lens around how to start a a mushroom enterprise and what all the components of that are. So the the one takeaway I'll say with that is that starting an enterprise is just as much in the business and, and marketing uh, skills and effort as it is in, in, in building your technical skills. And that can be a real challenge. We find that across all enterprises at the Small Farms Program is people often spend years and years building all this great technical expertise. They produce beautiful products and then they have no idea where to sell them or the selling is actually not something they want to do and they struggle with that aspect of the business. So thinking about those as almost equal parts is a really important part of it. And, and maybe if you not actually don't want to do the selling and you need to figure out someone else you can partner with who does want to do that. That's the biggest thing. If you just want to be the, the hermit in the mushroom house growing the mushrooms, you know, that's I know many people who have become spawn producers because they realize that's actually they just want to be in the lab doing that kind of work. They don't really want to do the sales. And, and that's great because most of their sales are online to, to mushroom growers and things like that. So there's there's room for everybody in this effort. So we're going to click on the outdoor mushroom page. Um, I mentioned this kind of summary chart that's here. And then for each of the species that we've worked with, we have some kind of media, whether it's uh, videos, fact sheets. In the case of shiitake, we have a 50-page guide here. That was, that was produced back in 2012, but is completely still relevant to, to an enterprise. That is collected from all the growers that we worked with and all their kind of tips and tricks about starting a log grown operation. We have a bit of information about buying and selling logs because you get into this area. Uh, we found with our operation that it's actually economical for us to buy logs from local loggers. It's much cheaper than always cutting our own logs. And so that talks a bit about how to... How to communicate with your local folks what you might need in logs. And then we have our budget tool, as I mentioned. For the other species, we basically have the, the fact sheets or the videos uh, or the articles to help describe the recipes for how to get these things established, right? Because I mentioned these, these are great supplements, um, but right now they don't have that um, staying power in terms of being the centerpiece of a, of a business for mushrooms, but certainly... If you grow these alongside your shiitakes, you're going to have willing customers as you build markets. Um, if we go to the indoor production page, at the bottom of each page is that same series of buttons. Similar kind of setup, but a couple more tools here that are particular to indoor. Um, we have some videos ar around uh, indoor oyster cultivation, a series of five videos that get into some of the basics. And we have what we call a decision tool. So this is a tool, actually a modeling tool that we developed where you can plug in different parameters, your room size, the number of racks, number of blocks you inoculate, things like that. And it'll generate uh, it'll, uh, the number of weeks your production will actually generate projections around how many pounds you might produce and what kind of revenue you might generate and what kind of labor costs you might have. So it's almost like then it's helping you create that napkin sketch around what it might look like at different scales. So that can be really helpful for folks. Um, it is still in, in testing version and people send us some edits all the time. And so we love to have those, but it does give you some, some, some of those kind of big picture ideas about what it can look like. And then finally, um, I mentioned we partnered with Fungi Ally. 
There are two guidebooks here, and they're they're also found elsewhere on the website. But there's one that over outlines the specialty mushroom industry. This this purple one here, and then there's one about commercial mushroom production that really walks you through all the steps and all the considerations for starting starting an enterprise. And I think is a good read for anyone who's, who's starting to dig in or, or wants to to deepen their knowledge about those kind of things. The last thing I'll mention is it's just a bit about our research on the Western page. I'm just going down to here. I'll just mention that on our network page, uh, we do list any classes or events that we do. I mentioned the online courses. You can find out about those. These are six-week classes that we, we offer through through the Small Farms Program. And then we have a um, couple things for, for folks that often are interested. We have a, a grower email list that you can join. It's open conversation. People are often posting questions or equipment they want to sell or things like that. Most of the growers on here are in New York, but a lot are in the Northeast, and, and we have national and international folks. Anyone's welcome who's interested in mushroom cultivation to join that list. You can just do that on the website. And then at the bottom of the page, we have a supplier directory. So folks are often asking, where can I get this material? And so we have a, a, just a listing of different suppliers in alphabetical order. Through our extension work, we don't um, make specific recommendations. We just give you the information to find the suppliers, and then you can you can figure out which one might best suit your needs. So that's kind of a one-stop shop for that kind of stuff. Well, that was fabulous. Thank you so much for that. That was a great uh, walkthrough of all that. and some fabulous resources there at the end. So thank you so much for sharing all that with us. Um, Steve, do you have a favorite mushroom? <laughs> Um, I have always a favorite mushroom at the moment, I say. So I'm actually right now getting into fall season, you know, foraging's over, so there's nothing fresh. I'm really getting into these. I don't know if you've tried or had the Black Pearl King oysters. Mm. This is this is like the hot mushroom of 2020. It's a, it's a hybrid between the, the blue oyster um, and the king trumpet, and it grows much easier it's much more like an oyster in its behavior so it's a much easier mushroom to grow king trumpets notoriously are much harder to grow yes by themselves. so this hybrid is fabulous and i just love you know i love the i've always loved the kings because you can like slice up the stem and kind of scallop it and that sort of thing so i'm very excited to, to incorporate this newer mushroom into our you know into our thanksgiving meal this year so that's that's my favorite for the moment but i cycle through you know you can't have one yeah, we've got a bunch of lion's mane that should be ready for this weekend. So um, I'm looking forward to those in the uh, on the Thanksgiving table. So, all right. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and uh, excited to get your knowledge out to thousands and thousands of mushroom growers.